Friends, uh, in the second talk uh, in the series on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and once again, reminding you that the atomic bombing of Hiroshima was on August 6th, and the atomic bombing of Nagasaki three days later on August 9th, 1945. So in this second talk, I want to focus only on two questions give them a more extended treatment. The first question has to do with whether one should look, as some people did particularly at that time, and as I believe some historians are still want to do, and that is to look at the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as part of a history of aerial warfare, war by air, and the history of strategic bombing. And there may be some justification for doing that, particularly in light of what I'm going to say today, I'm going to suggest to you. But I also want to hold out the view, which I think is the correct view, namely that there is something very different about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that's the first set of questions. The second thing I want to consider is the target, Hiroshima, in particular, because Hiroshima was the first target and then Nagasaki. So let's look at the first question. And that is to place it within this context, which really comes, except to those who have read something about the history of World War II and have read about military history in particular, and, 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 and then within that, the history of strategic bombing, uh, there's actually very good scholarship and interesting scholarship um, on uh, strategic bombing and the development of strategic bombing in the 20th century. Uh, what kinds of places were targeted initially and how did strategic bombing develop and how did it intensify, particularly in World War II? Right? Because it's not really a factor, of course, in World War I. And World War I is defined, and that is, I think, the overwhelming image of World War I. World War I is defined by trench warfare. That's what it's really defined by. World War II was a very different affair. Because by this time, you had armed forces, which included Air Force, right? So you had, you had obviously naval forces, and of course you had aircraft carriers by this time, right? It's, it's, it's the, the sinking of you know, a number of aircraft carriers that the Japanese had at the Battle of Midway, which turned the war in the Pacific in the first instance, because it meant not only the loss of these four huge ships, but it meant the loss of a large number of aircraft as well. But anyhow, this is not an occasion to really go into the military history of the Second World War, but rather to, to look at the whole question of strategic bombing. And what is it that really comes as a surprise, as I said, to the vast majority of people? And what comes as a surprise is that the number of people who were killed in the strategic fire bombing of Tokyo alone, the number of people killed in Tokyo alone exceeded the number of people killed in either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And if you look at the number of people killed in the fire bombing of Japanese cities, which I will now describe, in the months preceding the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the number of people killed exceeds 
the number of people killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki put together, not just the number of people killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the time of the detonation and in the few you know, minutes after the bombs exploded, but I'm talking about even in the even in the aftermath going into the months, perhaps not into the years because there the data is a little bit more difficult. Uh, you know, if someone dies 10 years later from leukemia, someone who had been in Hiroshima as a child, well, then I think there's a reasonably good inference to be drawn that this person is actually a victim of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, albeit 10 years later or 15 years later. And that person, a person is a victim of the bombing of Nagasaki. But if you simply take the number of people who were killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at the time of the explosion and in the even in the weeks ahead just the weeks ahead put together those deaths do not equal the number of deaths caused by the firebombing of japanese cities but who has heard of the firebombing of japanese cities so this is what i want to really look at here because one could make the argument that, well, it was simply a bigger bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's the difference. It was a bigger bomb. It packed a lot more punch. And again, there are different figures that are given about the TNT, the total TNT, but it's generally the number that is given is that the bomb that exploded in Hiroshima was 15 to 20,000 tons of TNT. Um, of course, this is nothing compared to what a nuclear bomb today has. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the most powerful nuclear bombs today would have the equivalent of three to five million tons of TNT, right? So enough to level, you know, virtually a number of cities together. But for that time, this was enormous. And Nagasaki, it's estimated it was 20,000 tons of TNT. So one argument that was made at that time, and this is how it was understood, namely that there really wasn't much difference between Hiroshima, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and what had preceded that the Allied bombing, particularly the American bombing of Japanese cities, the difference simply being that these were bigger bombs and these were bombs, of course, that use plutonium and uranium. Right? So that's the argument. Now, I just want to look very briefly of at these firebombing of Japanese cities. And there are books that are dedicated entirely to that, particularly in Japanese now in English, there's still actually comparatively less literature on the firebombing of Japanese cities. It's mentioned and discussed in quite a few books. I mean, there are relatively fewer book length studies of that. But one of the books that has a, a, a sufficient adequate description, and it is in fact actually the probably the best scholarly study still uh, of uh, the making of the atomic bomb. That's the name of the book by Richard Rhodes. It's a monumental book, it's 700 pages. Uh, and the blurb there by Tracy Kidder says that it is not simply a compre comprehensive history of the bomb. It is actually a work of literature. And I think that this is in fact a correct assessment. The, the writer uh, has done an extraordinary job, Rhodes, uh, not just in terms of scholarship, but the elegance of the writing, uh, the sense of irony with which he writes, um, uh, the awareness with which he writes about what all of this means is, I think, really quite striking. It, it's, it's really a magnificent uh, effort here. Um, now, he has a description of this firebombing of Japanese cities, and the architect of this was a man called Curtis LeMay, L-E-M-A-Y, uh, who by the early 1960s had risen to the position of being chief of staff of the United States Air Force. Uh, 
Um, he would have become a five-star general, except that a committee said that that a five-star general was really a five, you know, a, appointment uh, that was to be given only at a time of a national dire national emergency, uh, and that the honors that had been bestowed on Curtis LeMay were already adequate. Um, he had already been uh, honored by a large number of countries and of course in the United States. And this man was the architect of the firebombing of Japanese cities. There is but no question that he was sadistic. And as has often been pointed out by people who, had writ who have written on the politics of war crime trials and, and things of that sort, that had it been the Japanese and the Germans who had triumphed in the war, there is no question that it's not only Churchill and the leadership in the United States and Great Britain that would have been put on trial for war crimes. From the point of view, of course, of the Japanese and Germans, there's but no question that Curtis LeMay would have been one of the first people to be, have been put on trial for war crimes and that he would have been given the sentence of death, of hanging, because there is undoubtedly an extraordinary streak of cruelty in this man. If you read his own writings and his own pronouncements, that comes across very clearly. And I should say at this point that everything I'm saying about the firebombing of Japanese cities and about Curtis LeMay and about the atomic bombings is of course being said with the full awareness of the fact that this was a war that was fought with the awareness that the enemy had to be annihilated on both sides. And of course, the Japanese committed enormous atrocities themselves. No one is disputing that fact. And this was, of course, very clearly established in the war crime trials that took place of Japanese politicians and the Japanese elites at the end of the war. But nevertheless, we still have to consider the fact that there are certain kinds of protocols, even in war. And it is unquestionably the case that these protocols were violated at every turn by the Americans as well, notwithstanding all their pretensions, which continue down to the present day, that we always try to preserve civilian life, right? that we are very careful when we engage in warfare because we recognize the sanctity of human life, the sanctity of the lives of civilians. And of course, coming from the United States, which has orchestrated one genocide after another, beginning with the genocide of the American Indians. And then of course, putting black people in this country into slavery for hundreds of years and causing the death of millions of black people willfully, right? These same people are now telling us that they are the people who think about the sanctity of human life, right? And what was true here? I would read out a passage here. What, would, what was true here is something that is going to be true subsequently in world and the Korean War as well, because of the Korean War, it is the case that they had a policy, the Americans, it was called the two brick policy, that any structure that had two bricks together could not be allowed to stand. It is not fully understood yet by most people the extent to which large swaths of Korea, North Korea, were just obliterated by 
American bombing, which was far more ferocious than the bombing that took place even in World War II, right? So here is, this is the 20th Air Force. So that's a portion of the Air Force. And this is being commanded by Curtis LeMay. And this is the bombing directive that their committee had given which stipulates what the United States policy, Air Force policy would be vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And this is on page 627 of Richard Rhodes' book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. It should be remembered that in our selection of any target, so this is a discussion of the targets for the bombing, the 20th Air Force is operating primarily to laying waste all the main Japanese cities and that they do not propose to save some important primary target for us if it interferes with the operation of the war from their point of view. Let me interject here and say that this was apropos of the fact that the target committee charged with picking the targets for the atomic bombing had put aside a number of cities and said these should not be bombed, firebombed. They should not be firebombed. We'll try to understand why they said that. And the 20th Air Force is saying, well, our policy is to lay waste, to lay to waste every Japanese city, right? And please don't interfere with, with our plans effectively, right? And I continue the quote now. Their existing procedure has been to bomb the hell out of Tokyo, bomb the aircraft, manufacturing and assembly plants, en engine plants, and in general paralyze the aircraft industry so as to eliminate opposition to the 20th Air Force operations. The 20th Air Force is systematically bombing out the following cities with the prime purpose in mind of not leaving one stone lying on another, one stone lying on another. This is the two brick policy. Most people think, the military historians who, who have looked at Korea know that that's what the Americans used, the two stone policy, two brick policy in Korea. It was also used at the firebombing of Japanese cities. And this is a list of cities that they say that they are systematically bombing out. Tokyo, Yokohama, Nagoya, Osaka, Kyoto, Kobe, Yavata, and Nagasaki. They hadn't actually started doing that with Kyoto at this point in time. Now we will, we will get back to this question of how Hiroshima was targeted because Kyoto was in the sights of the American military planners but eventually they decided to spare the city. But when we go back to the question of the firebombing of, Jap of Japanese cities, so, that, so Richard Rhodes tells you in a few pages what this really entailed. It's a graphic description. Um, and the argument that, that he advances here is, he simply says that this was decided upon by Curtis LeMay essentially on his own because he was seeking to find a way, a demonstrable way in which the Americans could defeat the Japanese without a land invasion, right? Because if the defeat of the Japanese would involve a land invasion, then it would be a repeat of what happened in Iwo Jima. And the Americans had seen what had happened in Iwo Jima. They won there, but they lost a huge number of soldiers. And they found that the Japanese were willing to defend to the last, to the last man. And some Americans would say to the last woman and the last child, right? So when we speak about the firebombing, what we're talking about is using B-29s. The B-29 was called the super fortress, flying them in enormous formations, 
with an enormous payload. And one of the things that Curtis LeMay did was he modified the aircraft a little bit. He removed the seats for much of the crew because he figured the more payload that you could have, the greater the number of bombs that you could actually have, incendiary bombs on the aircraft, the more effective as it was going to be. So all you needed was, from his point of view, you needed a tail gunner who was going to be on a server and the pilot. Ordinarily, the B-29 would have had a crew of five or six, just two people, right? It remove all the guns, remove all the guns, and have these fly at very low formation at an altitude of about five to 6,000 feet because he came to the determination after military studies that the Japanese radar would not be able to pick up flights at this altitude, right? Particularly at night. So Rhodes has a description of all of that and he gives you the, the statistics. He gives you the statistics. So this is in, this is in March of 1995. There were going to be subsequent occasions for the firebombing of Japanese cities as well, but it is, it is this particular firebombing which takes place um, beginning on March 10th, 1945, when 40% of the city was destroyed in the space of six hours. 40% of the city was destroyed in the space of six hours and 125,000 civilians were killed. So he says that his lead crews would carry M47s, 100 pound oil gel bombs, 182 per aircraft, each of which was capable of starting a major fire. Behind those crews, his major force would sow M69, six pound gelled gasoline bombs, 1,520 per aircraft. 334 B-29s took off for Tokyo in the late afternoon of March 9th from Guam and from Saipan and from Tinian. 334, they were loaded with 2,000 tons of incendiaries. Incendiaries, right? And what is the effect that they created? But before I tell you what effect they created, let me reiterate what leading American planners were saying. For example, a spokesperson for the Fifth Air Force said, quote, the entire population of Japan is a proper military target. The entire population, end quote. This is a statement, effectively, that there are no civilians. That this distinction between soldiers and civilians is meaningless, right? And Curtis LeMay, in his autobiography, offers a grudging admission of the fact that, well, perhaps certain boundaries were transgressed, but of course, he says this was war. No matter how you slice it, you're going to kill an awful lot of civilians, thousands and thousands. But if you don't destroy the Japanese industry, industry, we're going to have to invade Japan. And how many Americans will be killed in an invasion of Japan? 500,000 seems to be the lowest estimate. Some say a million. We're at war with Japan. We were attacked by Japan. Do you want to kill Japanese or would you rather have Americans killed? It is important to say that in the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the number of military personnel, Japanese military personnel who were killed was a minuscule fraction, a minuscule fraction. Not even 1% of those who were killed were Japanese military personnel, right? So these bombers come in formation, they drop these bombs, and it is a, it is a, 
absolutely nightmarish description, which you can get from a number of sources and texts of the effects of fire bombing of these cities. In this case, we're speaking about Tokyo. The same happened to every Japanese city, barring a few, which we'll look at in just a moment. Right? Kobe, Osaka, Nagoya, all of these cities were reduced. In the fire bombing, not the atomic bombing, to rubble, to rubble, right? And here is a description, a detailed description offered by the United States Strategic Bombing Survey. The Strategic Survey, Bombing Survey estimated, quote, probably more persons lost their lives by fire at Tokyo in a six hour period than at any equivalent period of time in the history of man. Right? I think that's significant. And that helps us to have a better appreciation of what then might be the singularity of the atomic bombing. Right? Does it have a singularity at all? But here is a description. And I will then move on to the question of targets and try to also explain what is the singularity of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The U US Strategic Bombing Survey said that this was far more than a firestorm that had been created in Tokyo. What had been created was a conflagration. The chief characteristic of the conflagration was a presence of a fire front, an extended wall of fire moving to leeward, preceded by a mass of preheated turbid burning vapors. These are not the wildfires that you read about in California and Australia where 20 or 30 people die and where they usually get prior warning and are told to evacuate. These are densely populated cities and Japanese cities burnt far more quickly. The homes were made of wood and paper. And of course the Americans knew that. The pillar was in a much more turbulent state than that of a firestorm and being usually closer to the ground, it produced more flame and heat and less smoke. And I omit a few lines here, the 28 mile per hour wind measured a mile from the fire increased to an estimated 55 miles at the perimeter and probably more within. An extended fire swept over 15 square miles in six hours. Pilots reported that the air was so violent that B-29s at 6,000 feet were turned completely over. And that the heat was so intense, even at that altitude, that the entire crew had to don oxygen masks. This is the crew of these aircraft at a height of 5,000, 6,000 feet. They're inside the aircraft. Imagine those who were on the ground burning, burning the fires of hell. The area of the fire was nearly 100% burned. No structure or its contents escaped damage. Right? This is the United States Strategic Bombing Survey itself that gives this opinion. So what then do we make of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Why do they have a singularity? Because what we're talking about when we look at the fire bombings is what we might call nuclearism without the name. You could call it that. You could say this was non-nuclear bombings with nuclear effect, right? Or as I simply called it in my book, Empire of Knowledge. So this was published in 
2002, Culture and Plurality in the Global Economy. And, and there on page 77, I have a small, very small discussion of this. And I call that section non-nuclear nuclearism. But I think that we have to say that the fire bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic bombings, sorry, were different because they take you to a different zone of amorality. A certain threshold was crossed. A certain threshold was crossed. It was harnessing the power of the sun. The nuclear bomb is like a demon. It's like a god, a god seeking vengeance, a Christian god seeking vengeance. Right? I think that when you have a bomb that detonates, and at the moment of explosion, it obliterates everything. And 50,000, 70,000 people, lives are snuffed out. It is as though you had, for example, gone to a large city and poisoned the entire water supply. We would say that something different had happened. Right? Some threshold had been crossed, just as we say that some threshold was crossed, was breached. Some enormous transgression happened with the industrialized killing at Auschwitz. And I think we will also have to bring Hiroshima and Auschwitz in conversation, which I hope to do actually in what I hope will be a series of books. One on Hiroshima, one on Auschwitz, one on Chauri Chaura, a small little village in India, a town, small town, 1922. Something important happened there, something that is pivotal in human history. But going back to this question, I'm suggesting that yes, there may be justification for looking and what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki is part of the history of strategic bombing, of war by air. But at the same time, I think it is imperative to understand that this was the atomic bombings were dramatically different because they take us to a different space of transgression. They take us to the world of amorality, not immorality, amorality. And many of you, or some of you may be aware of the fact that when they first tested the bomb in the deserts of New Mexico, that was called Tr Operation Trinity or Project Trinity. And the scientific director, of course, of the Manhattan Project, the scientific director, not the overall director, the overall director was Major General Leslie Groves, but the scientific director was, of course, Robert Oppenheimer. And when he watched the, the test explosion some, you know, couple of three, four weeks before, or some days before the, the atomic explosion at Hiroshima, uh, he quoted a verse, as some of you may be aware, uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, right? Um, a verse which talks about, you know, the thousands of suns, right? This is from chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita, the destroyer of all universes. But I'll talk about that later on, about Robert Oppenheimer and the verse from the Bhagavad Gita. I want to now very briefly address the question of why Hiroshima? So there was a long and protracted discussion and there was what was called the target committee. So the target committee was obviously a committee as the name indicates, which was 
given the task of attempting to understand, uh, attempting to come up with a list of possible targets. And um, much of this discussion that has taken place has recognized that there were some considerations before the Americans, when they were thinking about uh, what should, what cities should be targeted and what are the criteria that we should use. These criteria were laid down by Brigadier General Thomas F. Farrell, who was the deputy of Leslie Groves. Leslie Groves was the overall director of the Manhattan Project. And so he was representing Leslie Groves on the target committee. And he chaired the target committee. And this is what he had laid down as a criteria. I had set as a governing factor that the targets chosen should be places, the bombing of which would most adversely affect the will of the Japanese people to continue the war. That would most adversely affect the will of the Japanese people to continue the war. Beyond that, but notice that the first primary objective is you pick a target, the destruction of which is most likely going to produce a detrimental effect of the Japanese will to continue the war. Beyond that, there should be military in nature, these targets, consisting either of important headquarters or troop concentrations or centers of production of military equipment and supplies to enable us to assess accurately the effects of the bomb. The target should not have been previously damaged by air raids. I'll return to this in a moment. It, is, it was also desirable that the first target be of such size that the damage would be confined within it so that we could more definitely determine the power of the bomb. Now, this is crucial. Although I'm going to suggest that we will still have to do a real interpretive reading drawing on other documents to understand this idea of picking cities, targets that have not been previously damaged by air raids. So in short, the idea was that, well, you can't really drop the atomic bomb on Tokyo or Osaka because these cities have already been leveled. So if you drop the atomic bomb there, well, yes, there are people still living because, you know, if 100,000 people were killed in Tokyo within the space of six hours or whatever the number was, 125,000, 100,000, well, the population of Tokyo was obviously larger. So it's not as though if you drop the atomic bomb that you wouldn't kill more people. You do want to, you do want to destroy as much of the city, but the physical infrastructure of the city had already been reduced to rubble practically. So therefore, how could you really measure the effectiveness of the bomb? Right? You couldn't measure the effectiveness of the bomb if you were dropping it on a city that had already been destroyed. And you couldn't measure the effectiveness of the bomb from the test bomb because the test bomb was, was explosion was conducted in a large area that had been entirely evacuated of the, the population. And there were very few people living in the desert anyhow. You might have had some American Indian tribes, but the entire area had been evacuated. Of course, there was fallout from the radiation there. This is a subject, different subject, because there were, there were people who, died from the radiation in New Mexico. Something that the Americans tried to conceal for a very long period of time, but now is widely acknowledged and understood to be the case. The numbers are relatively small, of course, right? 
But let us now translate this into a different language. When he's saying that the target should not have been previously damaged by air raids, what they wanted was virgin territory. And my own view of the matter is it's not simply the case that Hiroshima had thus far not been bombed. I think it stands to reason that a number of Japanese cities were left untouched, a very small number, precisely because the Americans knew at the time that they were firebombing Japanese cities. So we're talking about going back to March 1945, that there was a very good likelihood that they would actually have the bombs in a few months and that they were going to use it. Whatever might happen, they were going to use it. Right? So I, it's not an accident that there are three or four or five Japanese cities out of dozens which are not firebombed and reduced to rubble. That had happened to the vast majority of Japanese cities, a few are left untouched. Virgin territories. And this was, if I may put it in this way, a kind of sexual conquest. They came to it as they would come to the sexual conquest of a virgin, a maiden. And in order to understand that, we have to understand, of course, the culture of masculinity, which was pervasive among the military personnel, among people like Leslie Groves. For example, here, this is from a different book. This is from a small book by Ronald Takaki, a well-known Japanese American historian, Asian American historian. The book is called Hiroshima, Why America Dropped the Atomic Bomb. And the argument is an argument that is not foreign to me because when in 1998, India became an avowedly, openly, nuclear state, when it conducted nuclear explosions, followed a few weeks later by Pakistan, when India went nuclear, the Los Angeles Times published an op-ed piece by myself. One of the first op-ed pieces, of course, on India becoming a nuclear state, and a piece which was entirely on the question of what I call the sexual and cultural politics of nuclearism the sexual and cultural politics of nuclearism. And that is exactly what I was referring to. Let us not forget that when India went nuclear, one prominent Indian politician said, pointing to the Pakistanis, Ab humne unko dikha diye, hum hijre nahi hai. We have shown them we are not eunuchs. And you say to your, you ask yourself, what relationship do, do eunuchs have to the whole question of nuclearism? And of course, my response is every relationship, i.e. the idea of being emasculated, the idea of being effeminate, and the kind of hyper-masculinity that is then produced as a kind of reaction to that. So when this test explosion took place, this is a telegram that was sent to the Secretary of War from George Harrison, member of the Interim Committee, as it was called then. It used to be the Target Committee, then it became the Interim Committee for the, the final decisions pertaining to the use of the bomb. To Secretary of War from Harrison, doctor has just returned most enthusiastic, <coughs> excuse me, enthusiastic and confident that the little boy is as husky as his big brother. 
Little boy was the name of the bomb that they were going to use on Hiroshima, the bomb that was dropped by the Enola Gay. Big Brother was the bomb, the first bomb, the experimental bomb that was actually exploded in New Mexico. The little boy is as husky as his big brother. The light in his eye is discernible from hair to high hold. Right? This is Stimson's estate, the estate of Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. And I could have heard his screams here to my farm, the screams of joy, right? When, when he hears that, ah, the test explosion has gone off so wonderfully. It's gone off so wonderfully. And I could give many such instances of this. But let me just get back very briefly and conclude with that to the question of Hiroshima. So what were the targets that were identified? I won't give the entire discussion here. There were four cities that were identified. There were initially five, tar five target places. One was eliminated very quickly for various reasons. And then there were four um, uh, Japanese cities that were uh, identified. And what is most important here is that Kyoto was one of the four. It was finally decided that Kyoto would be excluded because Kyoto was the cultural capital, the intellectual capital of Japan. And there was a feeling, there was a sentiment among some, there was a sentiment among some people that, well, if we nuke Kyoto, we are never going to be able to repair our relations with Japan. And of course, the United States was well aware of the fact that a new world was already coming into shape, that it was largely creating, but that it, this new world that was coming into shape was a world in which the Soviet Union would have a formidable place. And I suspect that, that somewhere subliminally, the Americans also understood that China, which of course was in the midst of a civil war at this time between the nationalists and the communists, right? But that China would eventually become a force as well. So that in other words, you had to maintain a world order in that part of the world too. And that if you actually nuke Kyoto, you took the risk of alienating the Japanese forever. And there's a very interesting, very interesting description given by Leslie Gross in his autobiography with which I will conclude where he talks about how he had a conversation with Secretary of State Stimson. And Stimson was adamant that Kyoto had to be excluded, that it had to be removed from the list of the, tar of the possible targeted cities. And Groves says that he was not happy at this, you know, because in fact, Groves' view was that, well, you know, Kyoto is the intellectual cultural center and people there are probably more intelligent because they're more educated than people elsewhere in Japan. And they will understand what, you know, if, if their city gets leveled, it will have an effect on Japanese intellectual opinion. And therefore it is actually to our advantage to take out, take out Kyoto completely. But Kyoto was eventually excluded. Hiroshima became the target. But what is important here, and I conclude my talk with that, and then I will take up some other issues in the next series of talks. And that is that the atomic bomb, the little boy that was dropped on Hiroshima did not even really touch the military targets that were actually 
10 miles away from the epicenter, <coughs> excuse me, or ground zero. In fact, it is estimated that there were fewer than 250 people, military personnel who were killed in the atomic bombings. So over 99% of the people who were killed were Japanese civilians. So if the target was, of course, military installations and all of that, and Hiroshima really was not a city that the city proper that had military installations. These were on the outskirts. Right. So I don't think there's any merit at all to the claim that Hiroshima was targeted. A, an argument made by some people who defend the bombing that Hiroshima was targeted because it was a very important military inst installation very important military site. I think the bombing itself shows something very different. And I think the discussions leading to the targeting of Hiroshima suggest something very different as well. Thank you. <clears throat>